Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta on this beautiful Wednesday. Of course, my name is Bryce. Um, if you're new, welcome, welcome. We are going to be going through the book, The Woman with the Alabaster Jar by Margaret Starbird. Now, of course, this is going to be found in our playlist called Understanding the Magdalene, which I believe is definitely inspired by one of my guides, Magdalene herself. There's a ton of different books in that series, including The Sophia Code, The Return of the Divine Sophia, Megan Watterson's book on Magdalene's Gospel, uh, The Magdalene Manuscript by Tom Kenyon, and of course, The Hathor Material, another book we're going through by Tom Kenyon. So again, now we are starting The Woman with the Alabaster Jar by Margaret Steve, uh, Starbird. Today, we're going to be looking at the prologue. And the prologue, I've, I've, I've scanned it a little bit. I know that this book, there's along with a lot of the stuff we're looking at with Magdalene specifically and with the, the true story of her and Yeshua, who people call Jesus, Yeshua was his name. We know that there's a lot of inconsistencies. There's a lot of, of um, mis disinformation. Is that the word they use now? The kids use nowadays disinformation. We know that there's been a lot of brainwashing when it comes to the controllers of our world. We know that the darkness cannot create anything. The darkness can only steal from the light and invert it or try to mimic it. And from my research and my understanding, Yeshua was never crucified. Now, Yeshua and Magdalene, from my research and my understanding, were also not Jewish. Now, normally this would not matter. Like, for example, I don't care what somebody's ethnic cultural background is. You're either a good person or you're not. It doesn't matter to me where you're from, what your race is. But the reason why this matters, why it matters that we understand that Magdalene and Yeshua were not Jewish, but rather Egyptian, is because of the crucifixion story. From my understanding, Magdalene and Yeshua were both raised in the priest and priesthood of Isis and Osiris. Yes, that is correct. You heard me correctly. All right. And because of this, every year they would reenact the story of Tammuz and Ishtar. Now, Ishtar is where we get the name Easter from. Tammuz was her other half, her masculine other half, who died at the age of 40. That's why Lent is performed 40 days before Ishtar, Easter. And Ishtar decides to go down into the underworld to call back her long lost love. And that story, the underworld is actually the earth that we know in our lives. We know it today. So it's a, it's a very symbolic story, right? It's a, it's a symbolic story, as Magdalene says in her own gospel, of descending into your own hell, into your own shadow work, into your own darkness in order to ascend back to the light. And so in the priest and priesthood of Isis, they would reenact this story of Tamar and Ishtar, or excuse me, Tammuz and Ishtar every year. The men would reenact going into the underworld. The women, their wives, would come then get them out of the cave for their resurrection. Nobody was literally killed. All right. It was it was a it was a, a reenactment of a kind of like the Ulyssian mysteries. We talked about Demeter and her daughter Persephone. Persephone right? And the Eleusian mysteries, which were part of the Isis and Osiris mystery schools, which was part of Magdalene and Alma Mari, Yeshua's mother, were also involved and they would reenact the Demeter story before they would bring their initiates into the underground temple for three days where they would do um, a psychedelic like ayahuasca or peyote. So I will link that video down in the description box below if you missed that deep dive. But so what we're looking at, again, is we're looking at a, a culture from Magdalene and Yashua that was steeped in Egyptian mythology. Well, let's take it back another step. What is Egyptian mythology? Who are the Egyptians? The Egyptians were the leftover Atlanteans. We know this from our look at the Emerald Tablet, as well as other research that we've done on this channel. The Egyptians were the leftover Atlanteans. The Egyptians were all races. They were not one race. That's why we laugh on this channel a lot about the blue people, which we have covered. I'll put that video down in the description box below as well. The blue people, if you look at all the Egyptian holographics, they show all races. White people, black people, brown people, blue people, right? And so we understand that these were the leftover people who, who come from the line of Atlantis after Atlantis fell. 
Okay. And so what we know now, or what we understand now is that Atlantis fell. There was a tribulation. Atlantis falling was the apocalypse. And then there was a period of time called Tartaria. Now, Yeshua and Magdalene were kicking off the line of Tartaria. They came through at the fall of Atlantis, right? To resurrect this Tartarian thousand years of peace. With that being said, in order to resurrect a thousand years of peace, Yeshua did not die. They had five children, not one child, five. These were the Merovingians, another topic we've covered on this, this channel. I'm a descendant of the Merovingians. I am a descendant of the Magdalene bloodline. What the Magdalene bloodline is, is the O negative bloodline. That is the Atlantean bloodline. All right. If we look at the, the timeline of Tartaria, a thousand years of peace, and then all of a sudden what happens, Gog and Magog, which is where we are now. We had the mud floods that totally jacked up our history. Nothing we know about history is correct. And then we have Gog and Magog where we are living right now. And then boom, after Gog and Magog, we have the ascension. The ascension comes, right? So before we get into that, I, or before we get into the prologue, I did, did want to express that, okay? And if you had asked me about this like five years ago, I would have absolutely believed the narrative that they had taught us in school. I myself, I, I want to make this clear. I am a highly educated person. I have a lot of different papers. They mean nothing now to me, but I have a lot, you know, right? Like I come from a very, very well-educated family. Everybody in my family is a damn doctor. I didn't even know when I was a child growing up, I had no idea that university was an option. I thought that by law, everyone had to go to university. I didn't understand that that was just law of my, my family that we all had to go to university. So I am very well educated. All right. So I want to make that clear. Like I do come from this world of acad academia, right? But I'm also smart enough to realize when I've been duped. And I think that's one of the most exciting things that I've discovered in this great awakening is that nothing we've been told is true. And so what are they trying to hide? How powerful is the secret that they're trying to hide to fool us in this, this level of fooling us? But anyway, I know that this prologue, which is Miriam of the Garden, is a story and it's going to follow the, uh, I believe, the uh, crucifixion of, of Jesus, which again, I don't believe in. Again, Jesus wasn't his name, was uh, uh, Yeshua. We also know that Miriam, Mary, is a very demoralizing name. Um, back then it was. Uh, we know that Magdalene was not Mary Magdalene. She was just Magdalene. She was not from a place called Magdala. That's another lie. She was Magdalene. Um, we know that Yeshua's mother, Mary, was Alma Mari. That's why like all the women in the New Testament, their names are Mary. Did you ever consider that that's not their names? That's like a, John, a Jane Doe name. So I just wanted to put that out there, but I am going to read the pro prologue and I will read it as it is. Um, but understand that as we're reading this, I do not agree with a lot of this stuff. Um, I know a lot of you don't either, but we're just going to see it as it is uh, before we get into the actual book. All right. So prologue, Miriam of the Garden. This prologue, Miriam of the Garden, is a fictional story, a plausible setting for the rest of this nonfiction book. It is based on the gospel narratives in the culture milieu of the first century Judea. Facts gleam from scripture and other contemporary sources create a reasonably accurate picture of how that story might have been. The greatest story never told. I wonder, I wonder if Margaret Starbird is still alive, the woman who wrote this book, because actually the greatest story never told isn't the fact that Magdalene and Yeshua were married. I think we all know that at this point. The greatest story never told was the true story that Yahshua was never crucified. The thousand years of peace have already happened. We're at the end of the line. We're going to ascend. I also know geographically, if you're new to this channel, it's a whole other topic, but Egypt, where they say Egypt is, where they say Israel, Judea is, is not where it actually is. A lot of it's here in the American continent. Um, Yeah. And with, just to set the, also say this too with with the egyptians with yeshua and magdalene being egyptian again egyptians were all races magdalene herself her mom was kentuckian from the planet kentucky that was her cosmic origins which is all of our origins that's the 12 tribes of israel is the cosmic galactic stuff not not from the listen fucking jacob was a dipshit I, i'm sorry like we gotta stop venerating he was he practiced human sacrifice and he trafficked women 
Abraham was a Satanist. Remember, the God of the Bible is, is Lucifer. That's not the God that Yeshua and Magdalene spoke about. That's a different, that's the good God. So Magdalene herself looked a lot like me. Yeshua was black. Yeah. The pictures, if you're new to this, the pictures they hang at your church of Jesus. Honey, that's Cesare Borgia. That's not Jesus. It's not Yeshua. It's Cesare Borgia. So yes, I do believe that we are coming to the greatest story never told. And through our research, through our awakening, through our hard work, my friend Emmy, our friend Emmy told me the other day that the word rapture means to uh, free the mind, to come out of mind control. So those of us who are coming out of the fog of mind control, we are rapturing our minds. And I do believe through our own research, we are going to be the, the narrators of the greatest story never told. And it will be eventually be told. All right. In this fictional prologue, the Hebrew names Yeshua, Marian, and Yosef were used for Je Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. She shivered, gathering her cloak closer around her slim body. It was cool now. The blazing sun had set beyond the garden wall, beyond the temple on Mount Sinai. The fragrance of the garden lulled her easing her taunt nerves as she sat huddled on the stone bench under the almond tree. The silver of the waning moon cast shadows on the path. She rubbed her toe in the soft dust, forming gentle mounds in the loose earth. A light step on the path startled her. She tried to discern the figure whose face was in shadow and whose form was enshrouded in a dark cloak. The man observed her for a moment in silence. Like a bird, he thought, so vulnerable. He spoke softly, trying to dispel her fear. Shalom, Miriam. It is I, Yosef. And the real Joseph would have not said, or Yosef would not have said Shalom, because they were again Egyptian. They had Jewish students, but they were Egyptian. The slim figure before him relaxed visibly at the sound of his familiar voice. Oh, Yosef, her voice caught. He gazed at her with compassion. She was pale and shaken, engulfed in sorrow. He reached out his hand, an involuntary gesture spanning the fragrant darkness that separated them in the moonlit garden. Yosef, she whispered, I'm not sure I can bear it. He tried to warn me, and I thought I understood. She was trembling, shaking in the darkness. Yosef reached for her shoulders and held her firmly. He had not realized the depth of his own pain until now. Her long, dark hair gleamed in the moonlight. Her eyes glistened with tears. Her hair was long, but it was blonde, not dark. Miriam, he said softly. He hesitated. Was she not distressed enough already? But he had promised his friend that he would protect her. And there was only one way. They must leave immediately under the cover of darkness. There was no telling when the authorities might come looking for her. Miriam, I have received a warning. We must leave Jerusalem tonight. It is not safe for you to remain here. Pilate and Harold may be searching for you. She turned away, gazing off into the shadows. So slowly, she turned again to look at him. You think it's necessary for me to flee? Her whisper was very, barely audible. He hesitated. Yes, Miriam, it is the only way. I promise Yeshua that I would protect you with my life. There is no choice. She nodded. Yes, Yosef, I know. He read to me the words of Micaiah, the prophet. I understand. It is for that promise I will do as you suggest. But what about Martha and Lazarus? Yosef shook his head. I did not even tell them where we are going. I have told them that I will hide you in the city. No one is to know that we are gone until the danger is past. For now, they will remain here. They will say that you are ill so that perhaps you will not be missed. We will send for them later. Yosef had it all planned. They would travel as father and daughter, attracting as little attention as possible. No one must guess the identity of the young woman traveling at his side. The authorities would expect them to escape by sea, so the ports would be the most dangerous. Instead, he had chosen to flee by the land route across the desert. 
He had packed a few necessities for the journey and would rely on friends to support their needs at their destination. They would flee into Egypt, to Alexandria. He smiled a wan at smile. Her youth and beauty were so appealing. The Magdal Elder, daughter of Sion, the tower of the flock. She must go into the fields to live in exile, just as the prophet Micaiah had warned. But through her, dominion would one day be restored to Sion. Again, he marveled at his friend who had shown him the verses in Micaiah's prophecy, telling of this exile and the ultimate return and restoration of David's royal house. Not David's royal house, y'all. Not David. Uh, David himself was a Satanist. Yep, that's true. It's actually in the canonized Bible. They didn't really hide that. He was doing human sacrifice. He was trafficking women. So was his son Solomon. We're not looking for David's royal house. We're looking for the galactic Lyran, which is the, the lion of the cosmos, not the lion of Judah. That's how the cabal inverts everything, right? But we don't we don't want to be venerating the cabal, okay? They, their bloodline is David. Their bloodline is the 12 tribes from, from um, Jacob, who is Israel. Our, the good, is the galactic cosmos. He, Yosef of Arimathea, had been charged with the responsibility of her safety. He would not fail his friend. We will go now, he told her softly. I have our donkeys tethered at the gate. I have spoken with Lazarus and Martha. We will send for them when the danger is past. I promise. She knew he was right. She had known all day that it would be necessary to flee from the jealous hatred of Harold. So insecure on his throne that he could tolerate no rival. And from the Romans, too. They feared the insurrection of the Jewish nation. We are now learning that the Roman Empire probably didn't exist. That's all probably made up. So to hide Tartaria, the hatred for the Jews, the hatred of the Jews for the Roman forces of occupation was intense. And their love and enthusiasm for the son of David, who had been so brutally executed, could kindle a revolution at any moment. Better that she, that's why I wanted to give the disclaimer in the beginning, guys, because this is pure fiction. This is pure fiction. Better that she flee, least rumors of the body's disappearance spark a suicidal confrontation of the people with the power of the Roman legions. She understood, young as she was, her husband had explained it all to her, holding her gently afterward while she buried her tears in the warmth of his shoulder. He had tried to comfort her, and she had tried for his sake to be brave, but she had failed, and she had seen in his eyes the anguish he felt for her. And I want to make this clear, too. So there was a Jewish prophecy that two teachers would come, not one. So once again, we've talked about on this channel before, the Jewish prophecy was that there would be two of them. And then the psychopaths called the Christian church went back and rewrote the narrative to make it one. So the two of the Jewish prophecy of the teachers that would come to usher in the new Christ consciousness, teaching Christ consciousness that would bring Tartaria were Magdalene and Yeshua. But it was a Jewish prophecy, but they were Egyptian. All right. I'm ready, Yosef. Let's go. Silently, he, she gazed around the garden, breathing in the scents of lime and lilies and dust in the air. I'm leaving my home, she thought, probably forever. My brothers and sisters, the house where we grew up, the garden where we played, the garden where I first met my Lord, our enclosed garden, she paused, remembering. When she says, my Lord, she's talking about Yeshua. Um, but if you've been on this channel for a while, you know that that's not who Magdalene was. She was not cowering in some garden. She was the one that actually woke up. Yeshua. She she re she figured it out first. She was the Christ as well. They both were the Christ. That's another another reason why he was never sacrificed. Why would they sacrifice one without the other? They were both the Christ. Equally the Christ. Taking Miriam by the hand, Yeshua walked slowly towards the gate, the cold dust of the path pressing against their feet in open sandals. He helped his friend's widow mount the waiting don donkey and untied it. Walking slowly, his staff in his hand, he led the donkey away from the villa. Occasionally, he glanced up at Miriam. She appeared to have la lapsed into an internal world of her own and no longer seemed aware of him. He walked beside her in silent communion, leading her out of the village and down the winding road, away from the home of her youth, away from Bethany and the Mount of Olives, and out into the desert, their path brightly lit by the moon. And Magdalene herself, she was extreme. She came from a very wealthy, very powerful family. 
So she had resources. Make no mistake. She had, she had high resources. She could smell and taste the grit wind borne on the desert. Her lips were parched, her eyes burning. She kept them half closed to protect them from the blazing sun and the steaming sand. She drew her cloak closer, shielding herself from the hostile elements in a cocoon of white wool. Yosef walked si silently by her side, lost in his own thoughts, occasionally seeking assurance that she was not too tired or parched, careful for her comfort, yet knowing that they must continue quickly on their way. She sat rocking gently back and forth on the back of the donkey, her thoughts drifting again as they had on and off for days. Her reverie was unbroken by the outside distractions, for the landscape was unchanging. She remembered when she had met Yahshua. She had been sitting on the bench in the walled garden of her home in Bethany. Her brother Lazarus had brought Yahshua into the garden and had walked with him there in the cool shade unaware of her presence. Lazarus was not Magdalene's brother. We've already covered this. He was Mary of Bethany's brother, which Mary of Bethany, probably her name was probably just Bethany, was um, Philip's wife. Lazarus was not Magdalene's brother. Magdalene was the only child of her mother, but had half siblings from her father, a previous relationship from her father. And again, if you read the Magdalene manuscript, you see this very clearly. It's very clear what happened. Yeshua, they they had known of each other their whole lives. Like Magdalene and Yeshua kind of grew up in the outskirts together. Both their mothers were high up in the priestess of Isis. So they kind of knew each other. But then later on as adults, he came back to Egypt, to the temple, and she saw him. At the, she was in the temple doing her priestess shit, and he saw her there, and she realized that they were twins. They were twin flames. They were the same soul, and they were the Christ. And they went through their teachings together and their teachings were not that yashua was here to save you their teachings were how you save yourself how you awaken the christ within you all right she had heard of this man yashua who had not he was declaimed throughout judea she knew how much her brother admired him now seeing him she felt drawn to him as well he was taller than average with long lean lines and beautiful hands his hair and beard were neatly trimmed, his eyes dark and intense, but the most compelling aspect of the man was his calm assurance, an air of authority and integrity that enhanced his statue. Then Lazarus had looked up and discovered her silent under the almond tree. He had drawn Yahshua towards her and spoke her name, but no introduction had been necessary because they looked at one another for the first time and she had realized that he knew her already. He had smiled. Shalom. Peace and well-being, she had answered, this time-honored greeting, and his look and this look that she had known herself to be beautiful. She could feel it in his eyes. She knew that she would always love this yet this Yashua, her brother's friends. She had looked down in confusion, blushing her long, dark tresses falling forward to hide her face. What's upsetting me is that they're making her out to be this like pathetic woman that's just like pawning over this man, and that is not Magdalene. She is Magdalene is a whippersnapper. Magdalene is fierce. Magdalene is savage. And she's fucking funny too. So I'm kind of getting annoyed that they're make, painting her out to be. This is this is how the church wants her to be, right? This is the painting the church has has painted of her. Um, so again, pure fiction. This prologue is pure fiction. I will find Martha and prepare something for your refreshment, she had murmured. And she had fled from the gar garden, almost tripping in her haste. Several months later, they had married. She smiled now, remembering how surprised she had been when Lazarus had come to her the news that he had accepted the Galilean stranger as his brother-in-law, an heiress of the lands bordering Jerusalem. She was to be the bride of Yeshua of Nazareth, born of the lineage of David the king. Nope, he was not born of the lineage of David the king. Nope, 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 not Yeshua. That's disgusting. The cabal is. The cabal's born of the lineage of David the king, not Yeshua. The marriage had dynastic importance, uniting the families of those true friends, David, son of Jesse, and Jonathan, son of Saul. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Not true. Lie. All a lie. Their friendship was a story that had been told for centuries in every Jewish home. Her marriage to Yahshua was political. No, it wasn't. No, it was not political. Not at all. Lazarus had explained to her, but it was a fulfillment of prophecy, that it was a fulfillment of prophecy, but it was not political. 
Lazarus and his zealot friends were convinced that the Herodian Tetrarchs, who collaborated with the Romans, had usurped the throne of David. Nope. They were also convinced that God would send them a demonic messiah. Again, the word messiah means a phallic pillar. So the word messiah means penis. Who would deliver the nation from the tyranny of Rome and bring about the era of peace and prosperity promised by their prophets. The stranger from Galilee had the correct genealogy. And he was not also a worker of miracles and wonders, healing the sick and casting out demons. Clearly, he was God's choice. Now he must choose his bride from the tribe of Benjamin, for it was written in the first book of the Torah that the silver chalice was hidden in the sack of Benjamin. According to their inspired teachers, this meant that a woman from Benjamin's tribe would be the instrument from reconciliation and the healing of Israel. No, because they were Egyptian. They weren't reading the Torah. They were Egyptian. They were reading the Emerald Tablets, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, not the Torah. None of this had mattered to Miriam. The elders could give any reason they wanted for their decision. They could not hear her blood singing in her veins. Could they not hear her heart's silent song? It does not matter why he chooses me. It only matters that I am chosen. Y'all, a lot of you guys know Magdalene as well. This is not Magdalene, is it? This is purely fiction. Pondering all these things, she had sought refuge in the walled garden, her shaded bench under the almond tree. Later, Yahshua had found her there. Standing silent before her, he had held his hand. She had looked up, hesitating, and shyly reached out to accept it. And every wound she had ever known had been healed. They had celebrated their marriage at the house of Simon the leper. Only a few close friends and their families had attended. It was considered necessary to keep the marriage as quiet as possible, least Herod discovered that the heiress of Benjamin had been united in marriage to the heir of David. Miriam had not cared that she would not be acknowledged in public as the wife of Yahshua. It had mattered only that she was the bride of the tall Galilean whose dark eyes caressed her, making her joyful, making her whole. They all knew they, all knew they were married. There was no secrets that they were married. And no, I think Magdalene's pretty clear. No fucking man is going to make you whole, sister. Like, that is not Magdalene's teaching. you got to be whole within yourself. The most successful relationships there are is when the man and the woman are both whole within themselves. No, listen, sister, again, no man is going gonna, is gonna to complete you. Wherever you go, there you are. Again, for those in the back who did not hear, wherever you go, there you are. So whether you're married or not, you're still you. You're still going to have the issue. It is up to you to heal yourself. That is what Magdalene and Yahshua taught. You have to heal yourself. You have to go into your darkness. You have to go into the underbelly of yourself to heal yourself, to find that resurrection within yourself. No one's going to do it for you. No one can do it for you. That's your power move. No one can do it for you. Only you can do it. The wedding guests had been jubilant, believing that David's line would be restored and Sion liberated. All nations would then flock to Jerusalem to worship the Holy One in his temple as God's word spoken through the Hebrew prophets had been fulfilled. The stone water jars of Judaism had to date been filled with a new wine, the Masianic hope for the future. Miriam had sat quietly beside of her husband, slim and lovely, her dark eyes shining. Nope, she had blue eyes. She had understood the political objectives of her brother and his zealot friends, but they had not seemed relevant. All that had been important to her was the tall, handsome husband to whom she was now committed. The promise of the psalmist was tucked away in her heart. Thy wife shall be fruitful vine in the re recesses of your home. Amen. Shalom. That night he had held her. He had called her beloved, and her joy had been unfathomable. The scent of wine had drifted from the courtyard into their room on the evening tree breeze as they slept. Y'all, they, they had sex before marriage. That's in the Magdalene manuscript. They were boinking long before they got married, as most people are. As, let me really, as most people are. So, and we know marriage anyway. Like marriage today is cabal. It's all cabal. So, Yashua spoke again, interrupting her thoughts. Miriam, Miriam, here, please take some water. Suddenly, she was back in the present, gently brushing the sand from her eyelids. 
Yosef was offering her the water pouch. Thank you, Yosef. You are very kind. He smiled at her. He felt a great tenderness for his queen. Her safety was his sacred trust. He had promised Yahshua. It was service gladly rendered his friend. Through her, the Magdal elder, dominion would be restored. But now, but for now, she must go into the fields to travel into exile, as the prophet Micaiah had foretold. Compassion for her waved over him. She was chosen for this role, but how much easier it would have been if she had not been chosen. We will be in the Nile Delta by tomorrow at nightfall, he said to her, lifting her spirits. For days he had been worried by her long silences, hoping that she was not dwelling on the horrors of those last days in Jerusalem. He would have had her remain in Bethany with Martha. The soldiers of the Sanhedrin had led Yahshua away, but she had insisted on matching her husband's footsteps all the way to Golgothia. Several other women had remained with her all day, offering support as she stood near the cross. Still, the cruelty of the Roman execution must surely have caused a great open wound in her heart. Like the thrust of the centurion's spear into the side of Yahshua that caused his death, Yosef thought wirily his friend had hoped they could revive him after taking him from the cross before sundown, but it had been too late. Could Yahweh not have intervened? <laughs> Yahweh's Moloch. This is such a propaganda piece of shit, this prologue. I'm sorry, Margaret Starbird, if you're alive and you see this. This is a propaganda piece of shit. Yahweh is Moloch. That's in the missing books of the Bible from the Old Testament. It's very clear. Yahweh is Moloch, the god of child sacrifice. So not the god we really should be praying to. That's the god the Cabal prays to. Not us, though. Somehow he had let his plans be thwarted by a Roman centurion with a long spear, or was it the men's plan that had gone awry? In any case, Yahshua had died from his wounds. Now their only hope for the kingdom of God on earth seemed to rest in the exhausted woman riding in his donkey, sipping from her leather water bottle and trying to protect her face from the scorching sun of the desert. She is the hope of Israel, he thought, for, the, for she carries his child. She carried five of his child children. Five. They were busy. They were very busy. And girl was fertile. So five. Five children that lived to adulthood. Five. Miriam drew her cloak in closer, trying to find shelter from the relentless blaze of the sun. She could taste the sand in her mouth, feel the st sting on her face. Her lips were cracked and swollen. A wave of tenderness touched Yasua as he, Yosef, sorry, as he gazed at her. How he had prayed for God's blessing in granting this woman a healthy child, the fruit of the marriage to Yeshua. They had five healthy children. That's why the Merovingian line it was five. Five kids, five grandkids, or five kids, multiple grandkids, multiple great grandkids, multiple, multiple, multiple great great grandkids. So, as you see, the promises of the prophets that the Lord will restore the throne of the house of David must someday be fulfilled. That's the prophecy for the cabal, not for us. A, sh a shoot from the rod of Jesse, Isaiah had, Isaiah, Isaiah had foretold, would be a just and compassionate ruler who would bring about peaceful kingdom of God's rule on earth. They had such high hopes. What a shock it had been to see Yahshua led away to his crucifixion, struggling under the grotesque burden of the heavy crossbar, falling and trying to rise to continue his way through the streets of Jerusalem. All their dreams had been dashed as the Roman soldiers had nailed the son of David to the cross. Their horror had been magnified as the centurion thrust his lace, ripping open Yahshua's side and piercing his heart. Now the hope of Israel's nationalists rode astray on a donkey across the parched wasteland of the desert and shrouded in sorrow in a white cloak. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, if you're praying to Moloch, then you're going to get a human sacrifice, so... Even if, as I tell you, Yahshua was never crucified, this is a lesson, though. This is a lesson, because the Baal, the Cabal, the, they, they worship Moloch. They worship Yahweh. And they do what? Human sacrifices. So they're getting you, they're brainwashing you by the churches to accept demonic rule. The God of the canonized Bible is Lucifer. That's not the God of the missing Gospels. The God of the missing Gospels is the true God. But the God of the canonized Bible is Lucifer. It's very clear if you read the Bible who the God is. 
very clear. If people still aren't, still aren't seeing that, then that's cognitive dissonance, right? That's why it's, we call, it's why that's why the church is a very destructive and dangerous cult. Miriam, surely you must be uncomfortable for these long hours of writing. Shall we stop to rest? Yosef broke the silence. She smiled wanly at him, sensing his concern, but not really caring about her physical discomforts. Pain no longer penetrated her consciousness. The separate suffering of their long journey had subsided into one low, all-encompassing ache. She slipped back into her reverie, lulled by the eternal sway of a donkey's slow gait through the endless desert dunes. She had known it was a dynastic marriage. She had not expected that Yahshua would look at it in any other light. She smiled now, remembering his tenderness, his gentle concern for her shyness. She was not shy. Girl's not shy. She could not face the bitter memories of those last days. He would not have wanted her to relive the agony and horror. Instead, her thoughts drifted back to the earlier days. They had not had many opportunities to be together. I could not tarry, beloved, he had said. The people are wounded and oppressed. They are crippled and blind. They think that God has abandoned them in their misery. I must go back to the streets and bind up their wounds and heal their broken hearts. And she had let him go. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Lies, 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 lies. She was the, actually the main one that was keeping him going because she was also had the abilities to heal as well. This is really painting her out to be just a helpless little pitiful woman in that, that she was not. I'll be curious to see what the rest of this book says because of this rest of the rest of this book paints her as the powerful woman she was. I would ask Margaret Starbird why she felt the need to add this story in the beginning of the book. At first, he had seemed surprised at his power to heal. He had told her once of feeling the power go from him when someone had touched his robe. He had understood that it was not his power, but the power of God that flowed through him. It was in his words and his mean, his inspiring presence that had captivated his friends and lured them the multitudes. She'd been deeply grateful when he returned to Bethany after weeks and sometimes months traveling to remote corners of Galilee and Judah. She was always with him. They were always together. The two, it again, a prophecy was two, not one. One can't do it by themselves. It, it has to be two, the divine feminine and the divine masculine, the yin and the yang. It had been enough for her to, to sit at his feet, drinking in his words and his presence, occasionally catching his eye or a smile. She could not tear herself away, but sat mute, basking in his light. Once her sister Martha had been angry because all the task of organizing a meal for the large group of disciples had fallen on her shoulders. Yeshua had understand and had calmed Martha with the soft word, but Miriam had felt guilty and had torn herself away to help her sister with the household task. Martha was not Magdalene's sister. Magdalene had her own servant, y'all. I know who her father was. I, I don't want to say who her father was because I'm not 100% like factually sure, but with my research, her father's in the Bible. Her father was very fucking powerful. So was her mother. She had servants to do this. She's not some pitiful woman, barefoot and pregnant at home, sweeping up after the men. That's not how this worked, right? Yeshua was looking for a balance of power between the divine feminine and the divine masculine, because that is what true nature is. It's a, it's a, it's a balance between yin and yang. In the last few months, Yeshua had talked to her several times about his impending death. The people had begun to say he was the awaited Messiah, the son of David. Nope. Again, Messiah means penis. And he was not the son of David or the line of David. They had begun thronging in the streets, waving palm fronds as a sign from the Masonic promises of Micaiah and Isaiah. The penis promises. The Messianic Messiah. The Messiah. The Messianic. The penis promises. <laughs> Sounds like a porno. He knew that the Roman authorities would not be able to tolerate turmoil among the masses and that the eruption was inevitable. A confrontation with the Tertrek of the Roman government would lead to civil unrest and bloodshed. He must turn himself over to the Romans before the street clashes occurred in which the innocent might be injured. Yahshua had told Miriam of Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant. He had tried to warn her and then he had taken her into his arms to comfort her and her pain had been assuaged. Now something dropped her memory. The psalm, of course. Now she remembered why she had been so appalled when she had seen 
the so Roman soldiers carrying lot, lots for the robes of Yahshua as he hung dying on the cross. It was all in the psalm. It had been told for centuries. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They have pierced my hands and my feet. And for my vesture, they have cast lots. The words seared her mind as she remembered the details of the crucifixion on Gol Golgotha. The moan escaped her. But when Yosef looked up, something in her face prevented him from speaking. He would not intrude. She seemed beyond comfort, beyond the threshold of anguish where she could not be reached. He knew, she thought. He always knew. This is why he showed me those scriptures, so that I would know that the prophecies of our people were fulfilled in him so that we could all recognize that he was sent by God. She had not fully understood it until now. God is so often scorned and tortured in, in his prophets, God is wounded. With a rod they shall strike the face of the ruler of Israel, says Micaiah. In suffering crucifixion, Yahshua had shown them the extreme dimension of God's woundedness. Her husband had often quoted to her from the Song of Songs, the hymn of the sacred marriage. Fuck no, because that was written by Solomon. Solomon was a Satanist. That's who the Freemason. This is just a load of shit, guys. I hope you know that. Like, this story is so fictional. It's a load of shit. Total load of shit. All right. Um, For love is stronger than death, she remembered now. Of course, in the ancient cult in indigenous to their land, the bridegroom god dies a sacrificial death and is buried. That's Ishmar, Ishtar and Tammuz, the Egyptian gods. Yes, that's what they were reenacting. Not some fucking prophecy, prophecy from some Satanist. Solomon was awful. I mean, I'm so pissed. Actually, if somebody from the First Presbyterian Church in Rome, Georgia is watching right now, contact me because I would like to debate you on a Zoom. Because I'm so fucking pissed that you you brainwashed us in vacation Bible school to venerate a man who did child sacrifice. You owe a lot of us apologies. And I hope that you yourself come out of your indoctrination into the satanic fucking cult. That's the church. Church means mind control. That's what it means. God pisses me off. It pisses me off so much. I mean, the, the, the teaching of Magdalene and Yahshua is so beautiful and it's so powerful and it's still very much the teachings of yoga. The fact that they have the audacity to invert it and smear it and making something, make it something disgusting and satanic is appalling. It's so appalling. And the anxious, okay, I've already read that. Then, after, then later, after three days, he is resurrected among shouts and joys of the people who have awaited his return. He was brought, he has brought fertility to the land, renewing it through death and rebirth. No, it's the feminine energy that brings fertility to the land. One evening, while Yahshua was re reclining at the table with his friends, Mary had taken an alabaster veil of spikenard, part of her dowry, and poured it over his head. Was not this was not the son of David the anointed one, the true king of Israel and God's chosen Messiah, God's chosen penis? And anointed means to anoint someone for sacrifice, by the way. Don't don't get your kids baptized. That's just my opinion. It's so fucking disgusting. I I do not like I was baptized as a baby and I say openly, I don't consent. You can't have my soul. I take my baptism back. I didn't have a choice in the in the in the beginning because my parents said it. But fuck you. I don't serve your God. I don't serve Lucifer. I don't worship human sacrifice, nor do I partake in cannibalism known as communion. The God that I believe in, the God of light, the God of source would never, ever, ever ask for a blood sacrifice. And fuck you for corrupting beautiful teachings. All in the name of Lucifer. You did it for Lucifer. That's why, that's why the, the preachers and the priests wear black robes. Wow, when I found that out. Thank you, Jordan Maxwell. Same reason why judges wear black robes. They're sworn into the cult of Satan. Ask your pastor why he wears a black robe. No one's going to lie to you more than the church, than your pastor. You are being pathologically lied to on a continual basis. Many generations. My children, if I ever have children, will never set foot in a church. Never. I will not do that to them. Sorry, this is me really mad. It really pisses me off. 
Yeshua had not objected to her action. Her disciples had murmured that Miriam was wasting a costly scent, but Yeshua had understood. In anointing him, she was proclaiming him both king and bridegroom. She had anointed me for burial, he had said. She had, had wept for them, kneeling before him, wiping her tears from his feet with her hair. So demeaning. So demeaning. Husbands, don't let your wife do that shit to you. That's so demeaning. Every now, even now, she could feel the tenderness of his gaze. Tears began to well up in her eyes, and the heaviness enshrouded her heart. I must try not to think of sad times, she thought. Eventually, she dozed off again, still riding a donkey led by Yosef. After nearly a month's journey, they reached the destination. One evening, as the shadows began to lengthen in the cosmopolitan city of Alexandria, which is actually, in my opinion, New Orleans, Yahshua led the or Yosef, sorry, led the donkey through the winding streets of the teeming city, seeking the Jewish sector, even though they themselves were Egyptian, not Jewish. Infinite relief and gratitude gave him renewed energy. They were safe at last. They would not be recognized in this foreign city. Wasn't foreign. Far as the clutches of the usurpers of the Israel's throne, far from the high priest of the Temple of Jerusalem and the Roman government governor of Judea, the true queen and her son, heir to David's throne, nope, would have haven there. One day through her, Dominion would be restored to Sion, just as Micaiah had promised, but for now she was safe in exile. The scepter from the branch of Jesse would preserve, and the line continued through her son. Eventually, the heir of David would return to Jerusalem and claim the throne of his birthright. Hope his rule would be established as God had promised to the prophet. So Yosef of Arimathea believed. He found the streets he was seeking, turned towards the house of his friend, and knocked on the door. No, 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 no. Again, the greatest story never told is the one that we're learning now. That all this stuff is a bunch of bullshit. The real story, the true story is so much better. Miriam awoke to the sound of pounding and reverberated in her ears like the sound of a hammer pounding the great iron nails into the wrist of Yashua. No, no, she cried out, turning violently from the noise in her half-sleep. She fought to open her eyes to escape the memories. The light from the outside filtered through the cracks around the door, proclaiming the morning. She was grateful. Now she was fully awake. Her body was heavy with child, her arms and legs still thin. Months had passed since her journey across the desert. She had been well cared for by the friends of Yosef. They had tried to make her comfortable, tried to console her for the loss of her family and whole land. Only problem is the real Magdalene had five kids, not one. And she had a husband there to help her the whole time because he wasn't killed. He was there to help her bring in Tartaria. Mostly she sought solace in her own thoughts. She was happiest alone. The sight and smell of Alexandria did not entice her. She was content to sit in the garden watching the little birds gazing at the bright uh, blossoms. Often she helped with the cooking or weaving chores she enjoyed. She was content. She tried not to think of Jerusalem of the traumatic days before her departure. It did not help. It only lay heavy on her heart. Now and then she wondered about the empty tomb of Yahshua. What did it mean? She was so confused and hurt. She had wanted to anoint his body as tradition expected. She had gone at first light on the morning following the Sabbath to the tomb of Yeshua's or Yosef's garden where they had laid Yahshua's torture body, but he had not been there. In terror, she had fled from the empty tomb. In her confusion, she had stumbled and fallen when she heard and when she had gathered herself together and looked up, she had seen the gardener walking towards her, desperate she had called to him, begging him to tell her where they had laid Yeshua's broken body. But then she had suddenly realized that it was Yeshua himself who approached. With a joyful cry, she had thrown herself into his outstretched arms. He had gently helped her to her feet, smiling at her, but at the same time shaking his head. Do not cling to me, he had said. Then tenderly but firmly, he had loosened her grasp, and with a sigh of farewell, he had faded away as suddenly as he had appeared. She had been left to stare blankly at the empty garden. The child within her stirred. Looking down, she smiled. It would not be long now. Her son would be strong and beautiful, the fulfillment of the prophecies, a just and right, righteous ruler, the anointed son of David. He would be most special son, the hope of Sion. She would wait patiently for God's words to be brought to com completion. Awkwardly, she rose from her bread and bed and dressed for the day, secure in her faith. Miriam's labor was long and difficult. Several times, she nearly gave herself away and then forced herself to return. Time dragged on. Finally, after long hours had passed and the day had turned to night and then back to day, she'd begin to be afraid and called out. The midwife bathed her forehead with cool water, gave her encouragement, whispered promises to her. She was exhausted. It must be finished, she anguished. Yet it went on, wave after wave. 
Several times she saw the worried women exchange glances. They were losing her heart too. They had done all they could. Now she was alone and exhausted. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The words of Yahshua from the cross echoed in her ears. I'm sure many women have thought that labor, though. Why have you forsaken me? Probably looking more at their husbands like you. You did this to me. <laughs> Takes two to tango. She felt herself slipping away from the pain, escaping at last. And then she thought about Yahshua reaching out to her, smiling her, taking her hand in his. Gradually, his strength began to seep into her, restoring life to her body and giving her renewed energy holy shit they can't even like these fucking deranged people who wrote this story can't of course it has to be the man that gave the woman power to give birth it can't be that the woman herself was just strong enough to push a human out of her vagina holy shit women you did that women watching right now who have birthed humans you did that the only thing your husband participated in was the fun part your body changed your body was the portal you are the one that literally pushed something the size of a watermelon through a hole that's the size of a grape that's you boo you be proud of that your husband did not give you the strength to push that baby out he might have been wonderful and in that room with you and holding your hand and helping encouraging you but you make no mistake about it sister make no mistake about it you push that baby out The last wild moment of abandoned to pain, and then it was over. The midwife held up the child, finally freed from the mother's womb. She smacked the baby on the back and allowed a small, sharp cry of surprise. Your child, Miriam, your baby lives, the midwife announced, jubilant after the long, desperate hours. A beautiful baby, a daughter, shock and disbelief, slapped Miriam across the face. It can't be, she thought. What about the promises, the prophecies? There must be some mistake. It cannot be a daughter. The son of David, the scepter of Israel, cannot be a girl. In their exhaustion and confusion, she laughs into unconsciousness. Women, you are valuable. I would be so stoked to have a daughter. I think I'd be a better boy mom, if I'm going to be honest with you. I think I would be better with boys because I'm a little bit more, uh, I'm girly. Trust, oh, don't, don't, don't forget. Don't, yeah, I'm definitely girly. Like, I would totally rock some hair bows with a little girl. But I would be, but I'm also very active and I, I'm very, I'm more blunt and I think I would be really good with little boys. But listen, if I had a daughter, if I gave birth to a daughter, oh my God, that would to me would be amazing. Like just, yeah. this is propaganda bullshit. I hope you guys know that. Women, you are just as valuable to God. You could be a prophetess too. Magdalene was. She figured it out before Yahshua did. The highest IQ in the world ever recorded is that of a woman. Make no mistake. Make no mistake. Hours later, she awoke. The room was fresh and clean. All traces of the difficult birth were moved. Someone had brought red roses from the garden and placed them on a vase on the table near Miriam's bed. A woman was standing quietly beside her, holding a small bundle. What was it? What did she want? Miriam could not remember where she was. She looked up at the woman in confusion, smiling wanly. Miriam, I brought your child. You must look at her. She is a perfect, a beautiful baby. Do not turn your face away from your child. The woman seemed distressed. Her concern for the baby was real. A child whose mother scorned, it rarely lived. Miriam gazed at her for a moment in silence, remembering the cloud of pain and disillusion that began to envelop her again. She turned her head away and stared at the wall. Miriam, only look at your child. See, she whimpers. She needs you. Do not forsake your daughter. Think but a moment. She is so innocent. She has done nothing to offend you. Can you reject your own daughter, your own flesh? From what I understand, Magdalene and Yashua had three girls, two boys. Magdalene did not listen. She did not reject her own flesh. Gradually, the words begin to penetrate into Miriam's consciousness, slicing through layers of pain. My baby, the child of my love, she thought. Now she remembered. Yashua had wanted her to come back. He had sent her back for the sake of the child. Again, giving all the glory to the man none to the woman she turned back towards the midwife hesitating and slowly reaching out her arms to receive the baby she gazed at the little red face the tiny fingers the infant stopped crying tenderness flooded miriam as she looked at her tiny daughter resting in the crook of her arm each fingernail was perfectly formed before i formed you in your mother's womb i knew you the, the psalmist saying 
It must be God's unfathomable will that the child of the promise was a girl. Perhaps the prophecies about the shoot from Jesse's branch had been, been misunderstood by Yahshua's friends. Perhaps it was not God's plan for her child to return to claim the throne of David in Jerusalem. Perhaps that was only the wishful thinking of men hoping to be saved from Rome's oppression. Somehow she knew her baby daughter must embody God's plan. Sarah, she whispered. I must name her Sarah, for Sarah believed, even when it seemed hopeless, that the promise of God would be fulfilled. I do not understand everything, but this I know. My daughter is God's answers to our prayers. She smiled down at the small bundle on her arms. A verse from Zechariah, the prophet, came to her. Not by any army, nor by might, but by the, my spirit, says the Lord. Comfort. She eventually slept, her baby cradled in her, her arm. Yosef came to sit by Miriam's bedside, watching as mother and infant slept. He was taken off guard by the news that the child of Yahshua might be a daughter and had never once occurred to him. His belief in the literal fulfillment of prophecy and the restoration of Sion had not left room for doubt that the child was a girl. She could not lead the armies of the Lord into battle against the forces of Rome. They would have to resort to other plans. I don't know, dude. I don't know, man. There have been a lot of girls that have really, I mean, most of the people in our community who are quote unquote truthers are girls. Yosef pondered the dilemma. The other plans would not include Marion and her daughter, but still he had promised Yahshua he would protect them. The friends of Yahshua would not accept Miriam now that her child had proved to be a daughter. They would never understand. There was no part, point in even telling them, risking exposing her whereabouts. She was safer here in Alexandria, dwelling in total obscur obscurity. Let them forget her. Let them perch, preach the kingdom of Messiah without her. The kingdom of the penis. Messiah means penis without her. He had heard of a land across the Mediterranean Sea where the grass and trees grew in profusion, where the snow covered the fields in winter, and where the grit of the desert sands would be mere memory. Perhaps he should take the child to Gaul, he thought. The vine of Judah could flourish there, safe from the sorrows of oppression. Yosef looked down at the sleeping mother and her child. Yes, surely they would travel on and make a new home. Gaul, in my opinion, Canada. Yo, Canadians. That's Gaul. That's the real Gaul. It was said that it was always green in the land beyond the sea and that the flowers bloomed there all year long. The God of Jacob, the Holy One, would lead them to the place where it was time to plant his vine in a new garden. Yosef smiled for the first time in days. The vine of Yahshua and the vine of Miriam, their descendants, would flourish in the fertile land beyond the sea. And from there, they would one day return to Sion to reclaim their heritage, as the psalmist had promised. Like their ancestors who returned from captivity in Babylon, they could be rescued from exile. Those that sowed in tears shall reap the rejoicing. Although they go forth weeping, carrying the seeds to be sown, they shall come back rejoicing, carrying their sheaves. Amen. Shalom. Waves tossed the boat. Merciless waves slapped its sides, splashed the riders of the deep with brine. They cling to one another in the dark, chant ancient lit litanies to the Holy One in their native tongue. Yosef, watchful guardian, questioning the guidance that bade him sail. With a heavy heart, he shields the woman and her child from the slash of the waves and the winds. They show no fear, trusting in their God. What courage, what strength in view this woman who faith has brought her to this moment of utter darkness. Gradually, the storm subsides. The wind abates, the waves tamed. Now rock the vessel gently like a cradle. Serene on the breast of the deep, they sleep. Watchful Yosef standing guard. Custom of the San Grau, the Holy Grail. Now his cloak is dry, crystals of salt from tiny stars as the summer sun dries away the water spray that hours since threatened to engulf them. His eyes burn and sting from sleep, unslept from the bitter salt. What does he see? A faint shower, shadow there in the horizon of vision, pain induced or land. He awakens his friends. Points north across the sea. Look, our God is with us. We have found the promised shore. Maximus and Lazarus retrieve the oars, abandoning the storm, and they begin to row. White beaches glisten beneath an azure sky. Cypress, citrus, bright wildflowers delight their eager eyes. The men leap into the shallows and drag their ark ashore. A tiny smile now flickers on Yosef's sunburned face. He remembers Noah on Mount Ararat. They have survived the terrors of the night. My sacred charge is safe at last. The Sangral, the holy vessel, 
of Jesse's root and Judea's vine. Be planted now beside a nurturing stream. Surely the shepherd of Israel has poured for us green pastures. He helps the queen alight, her sandals in her hand. She waves to the shallow water, to crystal sands. Regal she stands, breeze stirring in her hair. Her child is safe and free at last. Martha and Lazarus too fled our terrors of tyranny and the sea's caprice. Peace and joy envelop them. She gazes tenderly at her daughter, born in desert exile. Out of Egypt, I call my child Sarah. God's choice was not a son to carry arms in battle. Sion of David's house and Judah's tribe, strong lion to crush Rome's brutal fist and claim the royal throne. No God chose in time a daughter. What they sowed in tears, they shall reap rejoicing and they shall come home. Bearing their sheaves, and you, O Magdal Elder, Tower, Strongholder, Daughter of Sion, through you shall it come. The former dominion has been restored, but for now you shall dwell in the fields, and from there you shall be rescued. Shalom. Amen. All right, guys. So next week we will start with chapter one, The Lost Bride, and I'm hoping that it won't be as bad as that. That was. God, nothing pisses me off more than a than lie, than just this drastic lying. And it's 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 literally not anyone's fault. I mean, it is to a certain extent if you refuse to wake up and do the research yourself, it does kind of become your responsibility. Um, and actually, Emmy just told me responsibility. I, I love the actual definition of responsibility is you're you're able to respond to the action. It's our responsibility to respond. We have to respond to the action of research, right? And so I hope people that are still confused will do their own research. Anyway, hope you guys have a wonderful Wednesday and I will talk to you soon. Bye.